Uh, tonight's talk is going to be focused on bear safety and uh, great places to go hiking. Um, I attended a, a talk from uh, the New Jersey Fish, Game, and Wildlife uh, Division about two weeks ago, and it was fascinating. Uh, I, um, you know, I learned, I thought I knew everything about bears. I didn't know half of what, uh, what I learned from that presentation. And, you know, uh, all of us, all of us are, are capable and qualified to tell people about bear safety and how to interact safely with bears in the woods. They're beautiful, majestic creatures, and um, you don't have to be from the DEP or the DEC to, uh, to talk about them and, and to uh, hike safely in the woods. So um, without further ado, uh, I'll just start by saying that um, the uh, sources that I've used for this are primarily the uh, New York State uh, DEC, OPRHP, um, the, the, their counterparts on the New Jersey side, um, and a, a couple of other sources, including the New York New Jersey Trail Conference. Um, my one hat is as development director for the New York New Jersey Trail Conference, but I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, being involved with the Trail Conference, thank you, since uh, 1980s, I would say. And I got started uh, on the trails uh, probably at age seven because my dad took me out in the woods. And uh, it was such a great, great experience. Um, basically, just by way of qualifications, um, I grew up hiking in the woods. I love it. I ran cross country for four years in, in high school. And uh, at the end of four years, my doctor told me, um, you have arthritis. You'll never run again. Um, I got into hiking with a vengeance and uh, really discovered the natural side of things. Um, it's funny, things like uh, trail running and hiking are every bit as exciting as being out on a dirt bike. We used to race each other down ravines and come up every bit as banged up as the people on the motorcycles, but we had a blast doing it. And uh, you know, people using the trails uh, in uh, non-motorized ways um, are, should be embraced, and I, I think it's a beautiful thing that the next generation is getting into, uh, getting into trails through things like hiking and trail running and cross-country skiing and so forth. Um, part of this book talks about that, and uh, you've got uh, 35 chapters of different loop hikes that you can do in Harriman and Bear Mountain State Parks, but there are eight chapters that are suitable for things like cross-country skiing. There happens to be one approved mountain biking uh, trail in the park and other things like trail running. So. Um, in any case, I've had the pleasure of uh, being a hike leader for about uh, 20 years now. Um, have hiked all the Catskill peaks and a bunch of places, got to travel in, in Europe and so forth. Um, and then I volunteer as a, a trail maintainer and uh, uh, the co-chair of uh, the West Milford Environmental Commission's Open Space Subcommittee and, and a bunch of other things. But I'm just a trail geek, so I'm glad to be here talking about it. Um, the organization I'm representing is the New York New Jersey Trail Conference. The Trail Conference is, how many of you know the Trail Conference? Okay, a whole lot, that's great, that's great. The Trail Conference has always been kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, the behind the scenes group. Um, I lead a lot of hikes and people identify with, with hikers, with hike leaders and hiking clubs, and that's great, you know. Um, but I'm not the one doing the hard work when I'm leading the hikes, I'm just enjoying the, the adventure. What the trail conference is doing is the hard stuff. They're doing the building, the maintaining, the protecting of the trails, 2,150 miles of them. And uh, they're active in 22 counties across upstate New York and uh, northernmost New Jersey, um, right here in Harriman, Bear Mountain, Sterling Forest. Um, huge, huge numbers of miles of trails to explore here. Um, and what the organization does too is train volunteers, almost 1,900 of them, and they donate about 100,000 hours of labor. And that's the only way that it would be financially feasible for a member-supported group like the Trail Conference to ever uh, maintain that many miles of trails. Um, but they do more. They also preserve and advocate for open space, uh, for trail lands in particular, uh, long-distance trails. They buy, buy land. Um, and then they also are helping underfunded parks, which is basically all parks these days, um, to do things like uh, trail planning and design, um, as well as all the usual maintenance. And you know, I've seen firsthand being from West Milford, West Milford is a huge 81 square mile township just on the other side of the state line. It's an, imag an imaginary line and it's all forested. Well, up on the north side of the park, 
Um, there's an extensive trail network. People are hiking. Trail maintainers are out there. They're the eyes and the ears of the forest. But down in the southern part, there's the Pequannock watershed. It's owned by the city of Newark. And it has a few trails, but not a whole lot. And it's like the Wild West out there, you know, Wild West Milford. It's, it's like, you know, ATVs everywhere. You, you don't know what you're going to find in the woods back there. And, um, you know, we have these forests here. Uh, Mary Harriman made her gift of Harriman Park uh, over here in 1910. Sterling Forest was recently preserved. We have these trails and uh, we have these parks and having trails um, is very important because it, it uh, helps to keep the parks uh, in good shape and, and, and eliminate or reduce abuse. Um, trail Conference has about 10,000 members, about 85 member clubs, clubs you might recognize like ADK, AMC, all are part of the trail conference and, uh, and uh, you know, getting people out and doing what we're doing as well. And we also produce books and maps. We're doing uh, in invasive species control and a host of other things. So it's a crazy huge organization and uh, costs about two and a half million dollars a year to run. It's all on member support and, uh, and some grants and some state funding. Uh, with primarily member support from people who use the trails um, so, um, and volunteers. Um, tuxedo. Tuxedo is just literally surrounded by parks. So we have Tuxedo here, Tuxedo Park, Sterling Forest, Harriman going as far as you could see it beyond over here, and the Appalachian Trail, 191 miles of it across New York and New Jersey, all maintained by the Trail Conference. Um, Tuxedo also has, a, has an interesting heritage, the uh, very first trails, uh, one called the Tuxedo Mount Jones hike, uh, Trail, uh, was built in 1921. So the trail conference and uh, the, the concept for the Appalachian Trail were 1920. By 1921, the first trail was built, actually by spring of 21, so about five months in. Uh, and it was a 24-mile trail that now is known as the Ramapo Dunderberg Trail. Anybody know that one? Okay. So an epic hike. We'll talk about it later. But, um, <coughs> but based on that success, um, the Palisades Interstate Park Trail Conference, which became the New York-New Jersey Trail Conference, um, built the first section of the Appalachian Trail right here between Tuxedo and Bear Mountain. And, uh, and that was the start of it all. Um, so it's an exciting place. You get a lot of rich history in Tuxedo. The other thing is there are huge contiguous parks uh, right alongside of it on both sides of the state line. Um, it's a great place to live, and the bears agree. Um, <laughs> one of the things about the temperate uh, northeast here is that uh, it's a dream habitat for black bears. Um, they like hardwood forests. They like swamps. They like lakes. Uh, they like places where they can find shelter. Uh, we'll talk about where bears find shelter, but uh, rock caves are in abundance here. In fact, the, uh, the area is so good uh, for bear habitat that the sows average, sows, the female bears, average three cubs uh, per litter. And they can have litters about every other year. So if they have three, three cubs a year for 10 years, um, that's a pretty good run, and, and you can see why the bear population does well. Um, in this area. More on that too later. Um, so nowadays, uh, cobbling together the statistics from New York and New Jersey and then taking northernmost New Jersey and this part of New York, uh, the DEC and DEP estimate about 5,000 bears, probably more than that uh, in this area. Um, bears are super well adapted to their environment as well, not just here but anywhere. Um, they can live up to 25 years. They can smell us up to two miles away, maybe even more. Uh, they can smell other smells more than two miles away. So guess what, if you see a bear, there's a really good chance that it's smelled and heard you before you've come. Um, so you don't climb to get away from a bear because they're excellent tree climbers. Uh, you don't run from a bear because they can run up to 35 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from personal experience, I live on a lake, you, you all know Greenwood Lake? Okay, I live on a little lake that's like a mini version of Greenwood Lake called Pine Cliff Lake, and it backs up on Bear Fort Mountain. <laughs> and the bears literally come down off the mountain, 
uh, swim across Pine Cliff Lake and come into my neighborhood. Um, the area had a real serious bear garbage nuisance problem in the past, and the town got a grant and we have bear proof cans, uh, and they really seal tight so they don't smell the garbage as much, and they have a real hard time getting in, so it's, it's been helpful. But uh, they're very well adapted to their environment, and they learn to adapt to humans uh, quite easily, more on that. So bears have been in this neck of the woods, this kind of uh, southern Orange County, Harriman, Sterling Forest, and definitely northern New Jersey area uh, for quite some time. Um, and with productive litters, they fill in, and when they fill in, you've got uh, the females can reside in closer quarters with each other. The female offspring will sometimes share territories or overlap, but the males they pretty much have to get out on their own. They've got much bigger territories, about 15, uh, their home range is about 15 square miles, uh, and they've got to find their own way and find their own place. Uh, and uh, a small young bear that's been kicked out of its territory by mom needs to find its own place. And so this is what happens. This is why bears move into new territories, and that's a natural thing, um, but they, they have competition. Um, this is an interesting slide because it shows really where, they're, where they've been established and where they're headed. The light green area here are the places where bears have been since 1995. Okay. Basically, you're looking at Orange County, uh, Ulster, Green, Sullivan, and a bit of Delaware County down in this neck of the woods and other, others in other areas. But where they're going, this is only as of 2007, they're spreading northward and they're spreading eastward. And uh, interestingly, right, right about here, whatever that means, whatever bridge that could be or, or whatever. Um, so the bears are expanding in their habitat. And in New Jersey, they have just really exploded. So here's 1995. Basically, if you know your New Jersey counties, it's Passaic County, Sussex County, Warren County, and then you've been at Hunterdon, OK? Today, all 22 counties, they've even been seen in Hudson County, which is that unbelievably developed part of New Jersey that everybody thinks of when they think of New Jersey, um, which isn't most of the state. But uh, So they've done really well. Um, first off, we're talking about black bears. This isn't a black bear, but uh, um, we're going to talk about black bears because um, they're the only bears we have in this area. Um, they are omnivores. Um, there's a really great expression in German called Allesfresser. And it means eat or devour everything. That's, that's what they are. They're omnivores. Um, they'll eat skunk cabbage. They like nut trees and fruit trees, um, berries. Uh, they like insects. They eat a, quite a few insects. And uh, they like honey and the pupa from the uh, beehives. Um, they'll eat small animals, you know, your livestock, uh, chickens and things like that. And dead, dead animals as well. They're not fussy. In fact, they'll eat your garbage. They'll invade your backpack if they get the opportunity. And the biggest thing we want to do is we want to avoid those human food sources because that's when we get trouble. <laughs> um, so now it's October. Uh, I can't believe it's October already, but the bears are uh, going into a phase called hyperphagia, um, a period of extreme eating and drinking. It sounds like a comedy from Saturday Night Live or something with the uh, coneheads. But they're, they're eating up to 20,000 calories a day. They're drinking large amounts of, of water. Uh, they're getting ready to go into uh, their dens, uh, if they den up at all, and go into a state of what's called torpor. Torpor is like uh, hibernation, but it's not as deep a sleep. Um, but they don't, uh, they don't drink, they don't eat, they don't uh, go to the bathroom. They just den up and slow down. Um, so typically they'll den up around the end of the year, but I can tell you, as many of you have probably seen, they don't always den up. Uh, you could be in places like uh, Sterling Forest in January when it's freezing cold and see plenty of bears out there. Um, typical bear den sites. Um, when you think of a bear den, don't you normally think of like the giant cave and you walk into it and the bear is going to be somewhere hiding in there? Well, bears don't need a lot of space to den up. A rock cave shelter could be something that's, that's tiny enough, you know, the size of this podium at, at best. Um, and so that's, that's enough space for them. They'll also burrow into a hillside 
and uh, this middle slide. So it's burning into the ground and creating a hole for themselves. Um, and they'll have ground nests. So you might be hiking through a trail in Harriman, say, uh, walking through a field of mountain laurel, and you know, if you went into that mountain laurel, you could be encountering a ground nest. Um, so, and there are a lot of ground nests in places further south and flatter places because there just aren't the, the rock dens. Um, typical signs of bear activity. Uh, how many of you have seen bear scat in the woods? A lot, okay. This is a good crowd here, okay. Uh, so you pretty much know what it looks like. Uh, changes from season to season based on the diet, but basically it looks about like that or like a big, big pile. Um, you know, fresh, sometimes fresh lets you know that one was just there recently. Um, bear tracks, <coughs> we just saw them on the Redback Trail over in Sterling Forest off Southgate Road. I was doing a day of trail building and we found bear tracks in the mud. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that bears will often step right in the exact spot again where their track had been made. Uh, they're letting other bears know that this is their area. As with scratch marks on the trees, that's also saying, hey, this is my territory here. Um, and rubbing their backs on trees, you'll see fur on, on the trees as well at times. Um, again, what I'm, what I'm getting at, <laughs> it's a funny slide, uh, but uh, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to eliminate the food sources. If we can eliminate food sources, uh, both when we're backpacking and in our yards and camping, we're going to have less problems. Um, bear canisters are a great way to um, seal off the scent of your, your food. Some are strong enough that a bear can't break into it. Um, there was a woman in Sussex, a teenager in Sussex County, um, who was injured by a bear. Um, the bear wasn't being malicious particularly, but smelled the coconut oil uh, from her makeup in her tent. You know, so you don't want food in your tent or anywhere near where you're going to be when you're camping out. Um, along the Appalachian Trail, there are bear boxes, so you can put your stuff in a bear box and it's, it's a way the bears learn that they can't get into it. It's all good. Um, but we want to not let them smell food, and we also don't want them to be finding bird seed on the ground or have easy access to a bird feeder. Um, you know, they do recommend that you only feed in this area in the winter time, and uh, if you're still having bear problems, consider not feeding. Uh, don't leave fallen fruit or nuts on the ground uh, because they love that. And uh, if you don't have bear-proof cans, how many have bear-proof cans? Just a couple, just one, okay. Put your garbage out the morning of and keep it somewhere safe beforehand. Um, both the New Jersey and New York have the same kind of classification system. They're practically identical uh, for identifying bears um, and their behaviors. A class four uh, bear is just bears being bears. You know, bears will be bears. They may be walking close to or near your backyard, um, but they're just walking through their territory. Class three is where their behavior is beginning to be altered uh, by humans. Uh, by human man-made food sources. Uh, in both instances, if you call DEC or if you call New Jersey has its own hotline for bear encounters, um, they're probably just going to give you advice, okay? And uh, class two is where bears are beginning to show <coughs> undesirable behavior toward humans, but not necessarily aggressive, okay? And so that could be uh, basically minima minimal fear of humans at that point. Um, the only time when uh, the DEC is really going to come out is if, uh, if uh, the bears are class one, showing clearly dangerous behavior. They've attacked your livestock, they've attacked your dog unprovoked, uh, or they've attacked a human or threatened a human. Uh, or if they've entered a house, or if they're denning up under your house. So if you do encounter a bear that's a real problem, just jot down these numbers. Uh, these, are, uh, these are who to call. Uh, it's 877-457-5680 or call your local police in New York. New Jersey, 877-WARN-DEP. All right, before we get to bear safety on the trail, I'm going to cover bear safety at home really quickly. Uh, if bears are entering your yard, you want to, first of all, keep a safe distance, but make loud noises, scare them away. Um, 
Check your neighbors. Do they have food sources that are uh, enabling bears? Um, and if you have livestock, you might consider electric fencing, um, motion-activated lights, all helpful to that. Um, in communities in places like uh, Juneau, Alaska, where they have lots and lots of all kinds of bears, uh, what they've found has been really effective have been local ordinances that uh, restrict when and where you can put your garbage out, uh, bear-proof cans, and, uh, and, and those types of ordinances. So something to consider if you're having that kind of problem. All right, onto the trail. Um, bear safety for hikers. Um, if you encounter a bear on the trail, how many of you have en encountered a bear on the trail? Okay, pretty many, good. The main thing to do is not surround, corner, or approach the bear. You can view it from a distance, uh, but uh, you know, leave it plenty of uh, escape route uh, is the idea. Uh, never run or turn your back. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, as you're leaving the area, it's a good idea to back away, not, not turn and walk away or turn and run away, um, and speak in a loud, calm voice so the bear knows you're there knows that you're not afraid. And it's okay to look at the bear, but don't stare into its eyes. Don't create an eye contact situation that could be perceived as threatening. All right. So how do you know if you're too close? I've been too close before. It's not a, not a comfortable feeling. Uh, the bear will let you know. Um, if you ever, you know, have you ever uh, made your kid eat lima beans before? <laughs> you know, and they go kind of like, <sighs> It sort of sounds like that. It's a huffing sound. Or they'll pop and snap their jaws. You know, you can hear it, cl teeth clicking loudly. Or they swat the air, swat the ground. They bang the ground like that. You're too close, back off, OK? Um, babies on board. Um, nothing cuter and more photogenic than, uh, than those uh, cubs climbing the tree. Um, I've seen you know, multiple clubs, cubs. It's usually one, then two, then three. Up they go. Well, mama bear is probably down below and you just don't see her yet. Um, it's a good, good opportunity to get out of there and resist the temptation to photograph because that's a potentially dangerous situation, uh, as you probably all know. Okay, now these are, these are unlikely scenarios, but to be comprehensive, I'm gonna cover all of them. Uh, in the unlikely event that a bear follows you, uh, stay together. If you're with other people, stick together. Do not run, back away, talk loudly. Uh, if you have an air horn, use it, make noise, okay? And if the bear continues to follow you, you wanna group up, stand your ground, okay? You can intimidate by waving your arms, clapping, shouting, that kind of thing, but look for a graceful way to exit stage left once, once you get that hesitation from the bear, okay? Um, I'm gonna talk about a, a woman who uh, inspired us a little bit later and uh, who experienced a bluff charge. Um, if you've been too close to the bear, okay, the bear feels threatened, cornered, you've come too close to the cubs, a bear may do what's called a bluff charge where they come at you. Um, most of the time they'll stop or they'll veer off to one side. They just wanna scare you and, and back you off. Um, it's a scary thing. And what do you want to do? You want to run. Well, you can't outrun a bear. Um, the DEC suggests strongly that you stand your ground. Um, uh, if you have bear spray, have it ready. Prepare to defend yourself if, ne if necessary. And if a bear does make contact with you, uh, these are black bears here, OK? Not grizzly bears. We only have black bears here. The, the advice is fight back with all you have. Go for the snout. Go for the eyes, go for what you can. Kick, punch, whatever you can, okay? Super unlikely, but that's what you do, okay? In fact, bear fatalities are extremely rare in New York and New Jersey. Um, all across all of North America, including places like Alaska and the Yukon, um, there's less than one bear fatality per year. It doesn't sound that great, but um, if you put it in context, New York and New Jersey uh, have only had three bear fatalities in the last, in the last 83 years, okay? Um, most recent one happened in my town, West Milford. You've probably heard about it. Uh, Darsh Patel and his classmates from Rutgers University. Um, they were in a preserve in West Milford. Um, they were warned about an aggressive acting bear. Uh, they went anyway and checked out the bear and started taking pictures of the bear. And 
when the bear acted as the bear was bound to do uh, following them, they split up and they ran. So pretty much everything you could do wrong, they, they, they pretty much did. And, uh, and one, of, one of them was unfortunately killed. Uh, prior to that, in New York, um, there was a, an instance in 2002 where an infant was killed by a bear. You probably have heard of that. The baby was wrapped up quite a bit, so even that could have been a very unusual circumstance where the, the bear wasn't clear that it was a baby human. Um, but that is, and I'll take questions at the end. Um, and then the third instance, you have to go back to 1933, and uh, in that instance, it was uh, a boy feeding a tethered bear, a bear on a leash, uh, trying to feed a bear an apple. So that's, that's what's happened in our area. Um, so my top tips for a safe outdoor experience. Um, number one, eliminate those food odors. Use a bear canister uh, so you don't attract bears. The other two have nothing to do with bears. Uh, watch for deer ticks. Uh, check for deer ticks every time. We don't have time to talk about deer ticks, but they're a real problem, as you all know. And the third is don't text and drive. Drive carefully to and from your hike. Um, 40,000 traffic fatalities a year. You know, I go where the odds are. Um, that's the place to be most careful. All right. So about the bluff charge. Um, uh, we had uh, a benefit uh, dinner. And uh, yeah, I know Michelle was there, and a lot of you were there. Um, but uh, uh, we were really inspired by a woman. There are about 500 people through hiking the Appalachian Trail this year. And uh, most of them are in Maine or, or close, close to finishing their journey. Well, Stacy, um, Stacy's up there. She's up in Maine right now. She took a trip, a break from her trip to talk to us uh, about her journey. Um, in fall 2014, two years ago, she was in a hospital bed, paralyzed, couldn't even raise her head. Um, she trained herself back, and she said she waited until she was paralyzed to go hike the Appalachian Trail. How's she doing this? She's got special braces that are computer-controlled, computer, computer controlled, and uh, they allow her to move, the, move her legs with her hips, and the braces take over somewhat from there. Um, hard work, but she's doing it. And uh, in Tennessee, uh, she was with a bunch of her fellow hikers, uh, and they came way too close to a bear and the bear did that bluff charge. Well, they were all together at first, but then everybody ran off, except Stacy, because Stacy can't maneuver that well with her legs. So she kind of stood her ground and put her poles out and hoped for the best. And sure enough, the bear kind of stopped and veered off, and uh, the others were just in awe of her great bravery. So it's really hard not to run, obviously, um, but that's what you want to do. Uh, and you can follow Stacy's journey. I'd encourage you to check her out on Facebook. If you go to at, iron, or at AT Iron Will, you'll find Stacy Kozel. Amazing woman. Um, we have one other uh, person in the audience uh, who um, has had a lot of experience with bears. Um, it's our, our friend and neighbor, Mike Schneider. Uh, and he's, uh, you know, if, if you haven't seen him at the Take a Break or at Dotty Audrey's, uh, you've probably seen him on some TV station somewhere. Uh, so I'd like to briefly introduce my friend, Emmy Award-winning journalist, uh, Mike Schneider, and just let him tell you a little bit about his experience and his uh, series On the Trail with Mike Schneider on PBS. Thank you, thank you, everybody. <sighs> what power. Um, to get up here, I had to go past take a break, so I have ice cream on my mind right now. You'll, you'll forgive me. You'll forgive me. Bears like ice cream. Do any of you guys remember the, uh, the Catskill Game Farm? Remember going up there? You, you remember the bear pit that used to be there? Remember you used to be able to go and buy like ice cream cones and share them with the bear? One year, I remember when I was a kid, probably about, I don't know, nine years old, I have, uh, we had a kid brother that uh, we wanted to feed the bears, and he wanted to feed the bears, but we couldn't all do it together, so we sat him up. There used to be like a ledge that ran around the bear pit. We sat him up there and uh, proceeded to throw the ice cream at the bears, which in retrospect doesn't seem like a great thing to do, but back then it was a lot of fun. And uh, the bear decided it wanted my brother's shoes. And, and it started going, it almost pulled my brother in. And my mother at one point said years later, why didn't you save your brother? And I thought, you know, well, I had another one. Why do I need to save him? <laughs> 
when Don asked me to uh, to come and talk a little bit about uh, about my experience with bears, the first thing I did was decide, you know, I got to go for a walk, a hike around the corner from where I live because I'll think about this. A lot of good stuff comes to me when I'm hiking. My wife Michelle is here tonight, uh, and so we decided we take our dogs. We have four dogs. And being a good husband who's been married almost four decades now, uh, we divided up the dogs uh, evenly. Uh, I took one and she took three. <laughs> but the one I took is, is, a, is she's a Malmute Pyrenees mix. She's about that tall. She weighs about 100 pounds. And I would like to say I'm still capable of completely controlling her, but sometimes I have my doubts. At any rate, we're, we're hiking down. You guys know where the Eagle Valley Fire Station is, heading over towards the soccer field at Murphy Park. We're, we're going around the corner there, and suddenly, I noticed something. The, you know, the dogs are looking at squirrels and, and what have you. Uh, but I see something move in the woods, and I realize it's a bear. So I react in the way that anybody who was born and raised on Long Island reacts. I you know, freeze. And then I go to my backpack, which I always have with me, and I went for the bear spray, because I'm convinced, having been born and raised on Long Island, that anything bigger than a raccoon wants to eat me. <laughs> so, so I go to take the bear spray out while I'm controlling the 100-pound dog. And as I'm doing that, I think to myself, God, I'm in the process of helping to promote a television show. What's better than getting a picture of me encountering a bear? So I have the dog here, the bear spray there, and I'm trying to get the cell phone to get the picture of the bear. And I do. There's a, it's a rather young bear, not a baby, but a young one, maybe a year old, 100 pounds, 150 at the most. And I get this picture. And I can't wait, we finish up our walk, I go back home, and I can't wait to get it on Facebook and Twitter, because that's what the kids say we're supposed to do nowadays, right? So I put it on there, and I, I, take the, I took four shots really quickly, and I, took, and I took the best shot that I thought, I, and I zoomed in on it, and it was a cute little picture of the cute little bear, who, you know, he was moving around a little bit, but he just stopped, he looked at me. And I got that picture, and then I, we left. And so later on that day, I, th I thought, well, I wonder what the other pictures look like. And as I went back, I realized, as I zoomed out, that that cute little bear, which was maybe about 30, 40 yards from me, about 10 or 15 yards in back of that cute little bear was Mama Bear. And I thought to myself, oh, yeah. And the dogs, these killers, these, these hunters, nothing. Nothing. They didn't smell the bear. They didn't feel the bear. Now, I've had the bear in my backyard. Have any of you guys had bears in your yards as well? Yeah, so you know, you know, they're there. We, we, I feed one of my dogs outside. He's, he's, a, a, he's a chow mix. He's black. He looks like a black bear. And the other dogs eat inside because they don't like to eat each, with each other. They're like kids. And uh, one day I, I hear the dogs barking like crazy and I'm wondering what the heck's going on. So I go to my kitchen window and I look and the dog's name is Bandit. And I say, and I realize Bandit's not in the backyard which is fenced in anymore eating his dinner. He appears to be in the driveway walking towards the street. And I go to the, to the window, and it's a bandit. What the heck are you? And I realize it's not the dog. It's the bear. And the bear's doing the, the bear walk. You know the bear walk? It's just like. <laughs> Dogs don't walk like that. So the bear walks straight up my driveway and walks right in front of my house. And I go once again to get the cell phone picture, because we can't get through life without documenting everything on our cell phones, correct? So I get to the front door. I open it up. I walk out. Not that far, but far enough, because I know I can zoom in. And I, and I look at the bear. The bear looks at me, and the bear just stops. And it, this is a big one. This is about a 300, 400-pounder. And it doesn't do anything. It just stops and stays. And I go, hey, bear, get out of here. And the bear just like looks and walks away. Now, I tell this story to my daughter. My daughter is now grown and gone, lives out in beautiful Salt Lake City. And I tell the whole story, and I tell her, including the part that I yell at the bear. And she says, Dad, you are such, and she was raised around here, you're such a New Yorker. You're yelling at bears. <laughs> but that's, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. I tell her, that's the way we do things. That we don't do that when we're out in Montana, where she used to live, because out there, the grizzlies don't care if you yell. <laughs> but that's why when we had my granddaughter was born, and she was a baby, we would hike with her out there, and bear spray, of course. But... A crying infant is one of the best ways to alert a bear that you're coming. At any rate, I'm, I'm very glad to be here among friends and neighbors tonight and to tell you that we are. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see the show that we put on the air. Thank you. You like it?
Thank you. You saw it twice. You're the one. Two and a half times. I heard about you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's called On the Trail with Mike Schneider because why would it be called anything? You know, Mike Schneider, right? Uh, we ran the show uh, in primetime three times over the summer on uh, PBS stations, Channel 13, Channel 21, and also NJTV. The numbers, the ratings, because even in, in public broadcasting, ratings are important, were very, very good. And so they're encouraged about that. And we are now in what they call pre-production, which is also fundraising mode, to uh, bring the show back as part of a regular series. Uh, and we're going to base it right in this area. This will be hometown for us. This will be home base for us. And I envision, um, if all works out as planned, uh, that uh, we'll be able to start every adventure kind of here and go to wherever uh, our production budget will allow us to go. But uh, I just, from a personal standpoint, want to express my gratitude because what I accomplished uh, in producing this show would not have been able to be accomplished without my friends like, like Don and Ed and all the good and fine people at the New York New Jersey Trail Conference. Uh, these are the finest people. I say this ha having worked 40 years in television and broadcast journalism, which are not necessarily the same these days. Um, and uh, these are the finest people, the most committed people, and the most decent people that I've had the good fortune to work with. Uh, so I support their cause. Uh, I'm glad to be able to collaborate with them, and I'm just uh, glad to be able to be with you uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mike. It's great to hear from a local. Um, so now that we're all inspired, <laughs> let's go for a hike. Um, Let's talk about um, Harriman State Park because Harriman is the closest park to here. We can access it right from here. You don't need a car. Uh, you've got 52,000 acres of hiking terrain to enjoy, uh, about 250 miles of trails, and uh, 19 miles of the Appalachian Trail runs right through it as well. Um, so much to do, so much to see. Um, I, I was inspired to write uh, Circuit Hikes in Harriman by a book published uh, some 30 years ago uh, by William Miles and by my editor, Dan Chazen, who's a great editor, by the way. Um, keeps me honest and keeps, uh, keeps the details uh, intact. Now, Harriman Trails uh, came out and it was great. It's the Encyclopedia Britannica of the trails. It starts with A and goes to Z and it takes you on every trail from start to finish uh, with great detail about each trail. So as a hike leader, I like it because I can piece together hikes. And it also had distances. But now our maps have distances as well. But what was missing uh, from the equation was a book that was kind of ready-made, how-to, how to have a great experience, and uh, the planning part of it. Because you guys want to plan good hikes for different audiences, I take it. Um, you want to be able to plan hikes for kids, hikes for newbie adults, you know, for intermediate hikes and for challenging hikes. Um, so this is what Circuit Hikes is about. It's hikes you can do from a train or with one car uh, and that you can add on to or subtract from uh, and have an experience that's predictable uh, in terms of its difficulty uh, and enjoyable in terms of its highlights. So. Harriman's an amazing place because it's got that many miles of trails, over 52,000 acres, and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, you're going to find bears in Harriman, more this year than any year before. Um, there's no hunting in Harriman. So the bear population is kind of moving from New Jersey and Pennsylvania through Sterling Forest, and, and Western Harriman definitely has more bears than Eastern Harriman, in my anecdotal experience. Um, but it's a great place to hike and, and a great place for adventures. Um, so I've compiled my personal list of top 10 destinations in Harriman, uh, starting with best 360 degree view, uh, top of Bear Mountain, a very popular and crowded place. Go, to, go there on a weekday if you can. Um, but Bear Mountain is, is such a popular place that the trails, including the Appalachian Trail, were literally crumbling into disrepair. Uh, the trail conference would reroute the Appalachian Trail every few years, and it would wash out every time. So clearly some intervention was needed. And uh, back about 10 years ago, the trail conference uh, had a charrette together with other interested parties and began this process of, of making Harriman, Bear Mountain what it is today. 
there are thousands of stone steps uh, that you can hike up. Basically, they took the Appalachian Trail up the steepest and most difficult part uh, and made a, a bordered stair, uh, staircase up the mountain so that nobody would be wandering off trail, destroying the woods, and everybody would be able to stay found. Um, so it's an amazing place to go check out. On the top of the mountain uh, is an ADA accessible loop. So there's about a half mile loop trail you can do that connects to other trails, and that you can do with a wheelchair. So if you have people who are mobility impaired, uh, they're gonna get a great view, they're gonna great, get a great experience. Um, moving on, uh, finest Hudson River view. Well, Bear Mountain has a pretty awesome Hudson River view, but uh, I think the best one and the most inspiring one is the one that a guy from uh, Sugarloaf, New York, named Nick Zingoli took for me um, as a favor, because he's a good guy. And I, it's on the top of Bald Mountain, and that's what this is, okay? Bald Mountain, it's an 1,100 foot vertical climb to get to the top of it, okay? And so I said, Nick, would you mind doing it, um, you know, pre-dawn? <laughs> so that we could get that perfect lighting. And he said, sure, Don. And so he did this. And the next edition, he'll, he'll have another inspiring photo. Uh, so that's Bald Mountain. You'll find it in this book, or you'll find it in your tra trail conference map for Harriman Bear Mountain. Um, all of these you'll find in, in, in those. Um, toughest climb. Anyone ever try Pinjit Mountain or heard of Pinjit Mountain? Ken has. All right. It's a crazy climb. The only thing tougher in the area is Breakneck Ridge, which is another area where uh, the trail conference is super active, supporting safety and doing a stewardship program as, as we are at Bear Mountain. Uh, anybody uh, like checking out iron mines? Okay. <laughs> some are small, some are big. Uh, if you want to find the real monster mine uh, that's actually legal to, to visit and uh, in Harriman Park, not outside, uh, I recommend Pine Swamp Mountain, Pine Swamp Mine which is the Pine Swamp Mountain hike in this book, um, it'll take you to that. And that middle photograph, that's this mine right here. It's amazing, you walk through it. I, I led a hike there in springtime. I won't do that again because there were nesting ravens all up on the cliffs as you walk into this mine shaft. And they did not like our presence and they were dive bombing us. And, but it's an amazing experience and uh, very good climbers can climb up and through that hole in the top. Uh, not easy to do. Um, best rock scrambles. It's a tie. Popolope and Torn, uh, that's the one that's on the Hudson River. That's, Bald Mountain is south of Bear Mountain. Popolope is north of it. Uh, it's a tiny mountain by comparison to Bear, but it's got the best view of Bear, and it's a wicked steep climb. Really enjoy it a lot. My wife and I uh, enjoy that too. Um, the Lemon Squeezer is, uh, is close to you here. Hike the Appalachian Trail from Southfields, eastbound, and you're gonna hit, the, um, you're gonna hit that uh, Lemon Squeezer, which is a great rock scramble and a squeeze through rocks and fun times. So all that good stuff. One thing that I don't have in here is best waterfall because honestly, the waterfalls are just okay in Harriman. There are better waterfalls in other parks, but um, uh, what Harriman does have is great nonstop views. Um, West Mountain and the Timp, if you look at that, um, that shelter in the wintertime there, um, you're looking out at the Hudson River um, in the distance. It's so dramatic. Um, coolest rock cave shelter. We have a lot of trail shelters to go and, and stay the night in, uh, but if you go to Stockbridge Mountain, which is along the Long Path, anybody know the Long Path? 355 miles, New York's hometown trail. Um, working its way up to the Adirondacks. Um, you'll find that on Stockbridge Mountain. It's also in the book. Um, three Great Lakes. Lake Sabago is the biggest, um, most secluded. Lake Scenanto. That's, uh, if you do the, uh, the hike I'm going to talk to you about um, from here, uh, you'll get to Lake Scenanto um, and legal swimming at Lake Welch. Yeah. <laughs> lots, of, lots of swimming, but legal swimming there. And the best lake loop, if you're going to the Lemon Squeezer, you're going to pass Island Pond. It's a wonderful loop around it you can make. Um, and uh, that's one of my trail run chapters in the book. Um, I've specifically set aside eight chapters that are suitable for trail running and other uses. Um, 
because trail running is booming and you know, we want to bring people into the trails by any means possible that's responsible. And trail running is one of those ways that doesn't involve a bicycle, not that there's anything wrong with biking trails, but it's a very low impact uh, alternate use of the trails. So, um, and best historic remnant, uh, the spiral railway. They built a huge spiral railway on top of uh, Dunderberg Mountain back in the day, uh, mostly. It was never completed. Uh, the idea was it was going to be a cog railway to take you up to the top of the mountain, and then you'd slowly glide down with these tremendous views on the way. It didn't happen, but the tunnels are still there, and the cut-throughs are still there. It's really cool. Worth checking out. Uh, I think that's 20, chapter 24 in this, in this book. Um, and then Doodle Town, chapter 23, uh, is a historic uh, remnant of a village that was around even up until early 1960s. Um, so that's, uh, that's in the neighborhood, too. So much for Harriman. Other side of Tuxedo, you have beautiful Sterling Forest. Um, Sterling Forest doesn't have the wealth of trails. It has a lot more bears. Um, uh, but it has 21,000 acres plus, um, and it's got this huge biodiversity. Uh, I remember hiking through the, uh, the uh, private lands on the Sterling Ridge Trail when it wasn't quite legal to do so and being part of you know, different campaigns to save first the main part of Sterling Forest and then the hole in the donut and you know, a long battle and uh, one that I know many of you were involved in and uh, the trail conference was certainly involved as well. Um, and it seems like we're still trying to protect Sterling Forest at times. Um, but what's really great about this place is the biodiversity. Uh, I, 71 different kinds of dragonflies and damselflies. Who's, who's ever heard of that before? Uh, so it's a beautiful place, um, lots to do there. They do have hunting in Sterling Forest, but if you come to the Doris Duke Preserve, which is off Benjamin Meadow Road, um, there's a beautiful four plus mile loop hike that you can add on to, connect to the Appalachian Trail. It's a really wonderful loop, no hunting. Um, and it's a, it's a model for what the trail conference is beginning to do nowadays. See, back in the 1930s and that, the trails were built pretty much the same way, straight up the mountain, closest, you know, quickest way up. And all those trails eventually become, you know, eroded gullies. And as trail building has evolved, um, what we've done is bring on more skilled crews um, who can teach those skills to our volunteers as well. And it's a lot more, time and cost intensive to do, but when we build the trails right, they last for the rest of our lifetimes. And that's what's going on in places like um, Doris Duke is complete now, you can see that. And in places off Southgate Road, the Redback Trail and off Long Meadow Road, uh, there's a major project underway. Just have to say, it, we did uh, trail building. My wife and I did trail building one day over there on the Redback Trail off Southgate. And, they told us that if we built 10 new feet of trail per person per day, that was really good. And I didn't understand what they meant, but it's taking off the topsoil. It's digging down to the peanut butter colored mineral soil. It's building up with rock, a rock under surfacing so that uh, the trail stays put years to come from now. And then, you know, making it correct and making the grades correct. All this stuff is what, uh, what's happening nowadays. And, it takes time and money, but it really is worth it. So that's, that's Sterling Forest. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention what's just south of the imaginary line here. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of my friends from New York could not imagine the thought of hiking in the Garden State because it must be a swamp or a polluted dump. Uh, boy, couldn't be more wrong for right around this area, at least. Um, huge state parks, wild country, great trails, and not a lot of people, not a lot of people at all. Um, in fact, New Jersey was one of those states that, uh, you know, took its, said, we don't have a Catskills, we don't have an Adirondacks for our water supply. Northwestern New Jersey, that's it. It's that or nothing. And uh, with that many people, they basically set a high, aside the whole Highlands region of uh, Northwestern New Jersey as a water preservation area. And so, we hikers, we profit from that. So um, do check out uh, some of these, uh, these parks and trails. I'll get into that more. And then uh, uh, West Milford Channel 77 is filming tonight. Um, uh, I want to just uh, point out 
the township of West Milford, 81 square miles, um, and one of the mountains it contains, known as Bellevale Mountain on the New York side, is known as Bear Fort on the New Jersey side. Same mountain, different name. Um, the Purple Mountain Majesties of Bear Fort Mountain are different. Every place else has the gray rock that we see around here. Um, these, this is a newer rock. It's a sandstone quartzite conglomerate rock uh, that's super hard, super durable, great to hike on. And, uh, and uh, if you crack open the, uh, the quartzite, it looks like gemstones on the inside. It's pretty, pretty interesting. And it's an interesting habitat for wildlife. You see a lot of porcupines in that area and definitely a good habitat for bears because it's got swamps, sky top lakes, and, uh, and lots of places for denning, uh, lots of shelter for that. Um, Google North Jersey Trails map if you want to get that or you can get a uh, map through us. All right. On to hiking with uh, different groups of people. You want to plan out a successful hike. Uh, the toughest group in my experience has been the kids. Um, kids love the outdoors, but you've got to plan for it. Um, hiking with kids means planning a, a hike that's appropriate in terms of distance and difficulty, um, setting a realistic pace and attitude uh, when taking kids through the woods, and having a sense of fun. If I had one tip to, to leave you with for hiking with kids, is find out who their friend is and invite that friend to come on the hike. <laughs> There's much less whining that goes on when two peers are out hiking the trail together. Uh, give lots of compliments and snacks and just have fun and discover your inner child and, uh, and uh, that's a great way. Where to take kids. Um, uh, Cascade of Slid, how many of you heard of that? Um, that's over by Reeves Meadow. Um, popular place, go on a weekday if you're going to go. Uh, beautiful cascades, a little dry now, but a uh, great place to hike to. I'm taking the kids from Tuxedo Park there day after tomorrow, to Tuxedo Park School day after tomorrow, and uh, we're going to have a great time. Um, other places, Bear Mountain. Um, at the bottom of Bear Mountain, we've got stewards set up on the, on the bottom of the mountain who can talk to you and tell you great trail stories. Um, and there's an exhibit called Trails for People. And it's an interactive exhibit. You, you can learn about how the trails are built, and then you can play with the trails and, and walk over the different kinds of trail structures. So definitely fun for kids to check out. And of course, the zoo is right nearby. Um, lots of different uh, hikes. I won't get into all of them, but uh, feel free to take notes. Um, where else? North Jersey, um, the West Milford uh, Ringwood border has this beautiful view of uh, the Monksville Reservoir. It's easy to get to. A tip, if you're gonna go to it with kids, find Burnt Meadow Road. You want the north side of Burnt Meadow, not the south side, because they don't connect. So you wanna come up Greenwood Lake Turnpike, which is Warwick Turnpike, make a left on Burnt Meadow, and you'll find the Burnt Meadow Yellow Trail. Um, and it's only about a half mile up to this awesome, awesome view. If you take the traditional route from Long Pond Ironworks, it's gonna cost you two and a half miles each way. All right, um, another place further south, uh, this big rock formation that you see down below is Pyramid Mountain and uh, Tripod Rock. You can actually crawl under the rock. Great place to take kids. All right, but we're all grown-ups here. And uh, for those of us, uh, by the way, and those are great hikes for adults who are, who are new to hiking. Um, the one I want to talk about among all these, um, all these hikes, you'll find them in Circuit Hikes in Harriman. Uh, there are a lot of intermediate hikes in this particular book. Um, but Claudius Smith Den and Almost Perpendicular is a loop hike you can do right here from the train station or from Powerhouse Park. Uh, tip is if, if you uh, are coming on a weekend, you can park in the commuter lot. But if you're on a weekday, you, Powerhouse Park is the way to go. Otherwise, you pay for parking. Um, so Almost Perpendicular. Um, and, and Claudia Smith Den. Pick up the trail here at the train station or on, um, on, uh, on the road running through. I keep forgetting the names of them. There's East Grove Road and, and, and the other road. Somebody can correct me on it. But if you, uh, if you hike the main road from the train station or from Powerhouse Park over the bridge, under the highway, and hang a left, um, you're going to come to uh, the woods, and the trail will continue there. Um, you can do a nice five and a half mile loop hike, and that'll include the almost perpendicular uh, site, which is the view you can see is the bottom there. Um, 
And uh, Claudius Smith Den is a historic site where uh, the outlaw Claud Claudius Smith and his sons and his merry band of outlaws uh, did all their nasty work back in the revolutionary period. And uh, they were eventually caught. Um, some were hanged, one died in jail. It wasn't a good end for them, but they had their, their time, and this was where they hid out. And some of the caves can still be kind of seen in there. They're not completely filled in yet. Um, so if you're feeling adventurous, uh, you can add on and see such great sites as uh, Black Ash Swamp, which is a beautiful swamp, and you have this descending view from Pine, um, Big Pine Hill that takes you down the bedrock. You're like walking on the back of a dinosaur toward uh, the swamp and the mountains in the distance. Really, you guys have some great stuff right here. Um, challenging hikes, I mentioned Pinjit Mountain. That's what the climb up Pinjit looks like. And yeah, that's blazed. And you look at it and you say, really? <laughs> it's a lot better to go up Pinjip than down Pinjip. Um, that's one of the chapters. Uh, they said there's no circuit hike for Pinjip Mountain. Well, there is a circuit hike, and it's in here. So uh, enjoy it, but do it in a counterclockwise fashion, and you'll get great views of the Hudson River and all across Harriman Bear Mountain if you do this one. Okay. Um, I won't go into all these, but uh, uh, just, you know, Check also nynjtc.org. We have, we're revamping our website soon, but you can find great hikes, about 400 of them, uh, that you can uh, use to plan and prepare for uh, your hike. Um, the other thing I want to mention is our phones as a map. Um, we, we have been doing Tyvek maps, what they wrap houses with. Tyvek, for years. It's great, it's waterproof, it's pretty tearproof, um, indestructible. Um, but the thing that your phone map will do, the Avenza map app, which you can get on your Apple phone or your Android, is it will tell you where you are on the map. So if you are lost, even if you don't have cell service, if you've got a satellite signal, you can find out where you are. And it's a great tool for staying found in the woods. Um, just uh, go to nynjtc.org forward slash PDF maps, and that will give you the instructions to get on that. I can't recommend this enough because it'll keep you safe and it'll make for a much more enjoyable journey. So I'll leave that slide up if you want to photograph it. All right. All right, so I think I already talked about what Circuit Hikes in Harriman is. Um, what's different about this book is that it's a guide to 35 different loop hikes. Um, it contains elevation profiles, short and long loop options, history, photos, and special use chapters. Um, if you look at, uh, at the first page of it, basically this is a sample chapter. It gives the time, the distance, how hard the hike is, what attractions you'll see on the way, and the GPS coordinates so you can get to the trailhead. Um, and it also has this, which is the elevation profile so you can get a look at just how hard is this hike really going to be um, because distance does not tell the story, okay? Um, and you'll get, you'll get the hang of that. Um, but, you know, we appreciate everybody who's a trail conference member. How many people are trail conference members, by the way? Wow, that's great. You guys are awesome. Um, every time you buy a book or a map from the trail conference, every time you make a donation or be, uh, become a member, um, keep up your membership. Um, you're helping to make trails happen. As I said, it's a massive volunteer effort, but it still takes two and a half million bucks a year to keep the lights on and keep the trails up, open, and operating. And so, uh, you know, you might think that your $40 membership isn't that big a deal. It's a big deal in big numbers, and uh, we appreciate it. Um, so um, if you're not a member, there are some offers tonight. We're doing a half-price membership offer. You can become a member uh, uh, for $20 uh, tonight just to get to know who we are. And uh, you can also get this book for 12 bucks, and I'll even sign it for you. Uh, <laughs> um, if you don't uh, get to it tonight, go to uh, nynjtc.org, and, uh, and we'll hook you up that way. Now, uh, membership has its benefits. Uh, it also can quickly pay for itself. Uh, I've used the Dottie Audrey's uh, discount once or twice already. Uh, Campmore, Organico, Eddie Bauer, there's 37 of them now, even a physical therapy ed for your torn up knee. Um, 
So, uh, you know, it's, it's a great organization, and a lot of people have come together in support of membership uh, by making it uh, financially worthwhile to become a member. Um, you also get 25% off your books and maps. So um, I thank you again.